Well, good evening, early evening. Uh, welcome to all of you. <clears throat> I'm sure I've met some of you and some I look forward to meeting in the future. <clears throat> uh, for those of you who've heard any of these talks before, some of the content may be similar. There is some new content, there's some repetitive content. The goal really for this is to get through some basics. And I'm going to try to go a little bit quickly uh, because I think the core feature of this is to be able to answer questions. And I'll take a, a brief survey at the end. Uh, when we did this several months ago, there was a request that we have a lot more time for questions. We created a day where we just did solely question and answers, and I'm certainly happy to do that uh, anytime. Um, with that, I'll just move forward and uh, go ahead and send your questions as you desire. Uh, we are not advancing. These are my disclosures. Nothing's really relevant to this talk. I am the market president for CORE, as she, uh, she stated. Uh, <clears throat> my practice is solely based at Providence. Uh, we've been here a long time. I run the residency committee, uh, residency program. I run the laboratory here. And we've been at Providence with Peretta for over 60 years and really basically have founded most all the programs at the institution. So hip and knee arthritis, uh, does this point her work? Does this show? Okay, good. So you can see this is a knee joint. Here's a knee joint that's good with a nice space. Here's a knee joint with bad and there's no space, <clears throat> bone on bone. So when you lose the articular surface, the cartilage, that's arthritis. So you can see the same thing with the hip. Here's hip, you can see the white part here is cartilage. You can see this bare area here, cartilage worn away. This is an arthroscopy picture uh, and uh, show the same thing. This is really jumpy. This is just a little bit of a, a quick picture showing what cartilage looks like. So again, you can see in the arthroscopy picture that bare area where the cartilage is worn away. The blue picture is a <clears throat> slide from one of our animal studies. And you can see that the blue is a nice, thick, firm, cartilaginous layers with lots of cells that line up. The crack that you had is something that we created. We were looking at a, a healing model, but you can see that cartilage is a living, breathing uh, animal. <clears throat> arthritis is common. Millions of Americans have arthritis. Millions have uh, issues that affect their activities of daily living. Uh, we have people that have work limitations. It's a leading cause of disability. It costs billions of dollars to manage and treat and it may be the most common disabling condition, at least in US women. Uh, a great, great preponderance of people are young. So while we treat with arthroplasty, you're in hip replacements, generally older patients, that has really crept down. So probably the largest growing population of patients having uh, hip and knee replacements are under 65. Uh, again, here's a picture of knee arthritis. You can see the arthritic knee, bone on bone. It's in a knock knee pattern. I'm sorry, in a bow legged pattern. You can see the normal knee next to it. And here are the two <clears throat> patterns that we generally see. We see knock knees and we see bow legs. When you're knock knee versus bow leg, they actually behave differently. The more typical pattern is the, I'm trying not to get this to jump, is this one. So you wear out the inside part of the knee and you get a little bowed. This is less common is the knock knee. With the bow-legged pattern, we call that varus. People tend to have pain, they have swelling, they have lots of complaints functionally, and they usually come to us generally earlier than the knock knees complaining that their knee hurts and they don't like it. With the knock knee pattern called valgus, people tend often not to complain so much of pain, they often complain of instability, weakness, fatigue, problems with stairs or hills, as are presenting symptom, and when you say, well, is it painful? It's going, well, it's kind of painful. Well, it's not so bad. It's really the functional part that bothers them more. <clears throat> I love physical therapy. I think therapy is a great way to learn how to exercise again. I think they're very effective at helping with swelling and helping with motion. <clears throat> we want you to be active. If that means using a cane or a walker, great. Uh, I recommend strongly the picture on the right, which are walking sticks. They don't look like canes. You can use them upright. You can use two in your hand. And people think you're just being functional, which often will make you uh, perform better. You'll go longer. You'll unload your knees or hip. And I think they're very, very effective at getting outside to do things. 
we do in fact give a lot of steroid injections. Steroids are very effective at decreasing the inflammatory response. Um, I can't really tell you how long they will last. We generally don't like doing steroid injections more than once every three months. There's not technically a limit on how many you can get. Uh, people often worry about um, cartilage or soft tissue breakdown, but generally the people getting injections already have substantial changes in their knees or hips. Uh, so we don't worry that so much. Uh, the one thing I will tell you is when you decide you're done with things like injections, and if you're thinking about a knee or hip replacement, you cannot have a joint replacement within 90 days of an injection, and that's an injection of anything. Uh, the data is pretty clear on that with large uh, meta-analysis showing that if you have a needle stuck into the hip or knee within 90 days of a surgery, your chance of having an infection goes up significantly. People ask about the gel shots, chicken rooster combs, whatever uh, different device. There are some now that are recombinant. Uh, these have been around for many, many years. Uh, they have a different fractionation, so there's high and low molecular weights. Um, generally, the higher, <coughs> excuse me, the higher molecular weights tend to be a little bit more desirable. Uh, they first came out for the use of the racehorse industry. Um, they were unfortunately marketed as a device. So some of the early data that we would have liked to see relative to outcome pain reliefs and, and um, the actual biochemical response didn't really get published or designed the way we wanted because once it was approved as a device, uh, basically the companies were selling it and then it became an issue of does it help pain or not? Um, it's a little bit hard to predict. I'd say somewhere in my you know, my experience would be 50% of the people say they feel better for a period of time, but it's certainly not predictable. I get lots of questions about stem cells. There's enough, a number, a number of different varietals. There's some that need come from bone marrow. You need a, a needle stuck in your uh, bone to get that. <clears throat> there's some that are from fat cells. You need to take out fat to do that. And there's some uh, PRP, which is very common, where you draw blood and you spit it out. And you can see in the picture uh, top right, uh, the <clears throat> there's a plasma rich and a plasma poor uh, fractionation. We can take that and inject that back into your knee. Uh, and usually people get, for arthritis, three injections. Uh, the evidence for pain relief is pretty good. It will not build your cartilage and it will not cure your arthritis. Unfortunately, all of these devices at this point require an out-of-pocket expense as they're not covered by insurers. So <clears throat> I would be cautious if somebody is telling you they're going to give you something that seems almost too good to be true, it probably is, especially if they're charging cash. Uh, arthroscopy. Arthroscopy, putting a scope into a knee, is not in any way a treatment of arthritis. It's not meant to be that. The data is very clear. We do not do arthroscopy for arthritis. Now, when you would do an ar arthroscopy, is something like on the bottom left. Uh, so I get my pointer here. So you can see this is really nice looking cartilage over the bone. Here's the meniscus. There's a rip in the meniscus, and that piece is flicking in and out and we could take that out. Here's another one. You can see that piece is torn. The surface of the bone looks pretty good and you could take that piece out. Here's a very arthritic knee. And you can imagine taking out this piece here isn't gonna do anything because this area here is already quite beat up. So <clears throat> that brings us to joint replacements, arthroplasty. We do these to help pain. <clears throat> we help restore motion. We really wanna help stability and we wanna improve function. You are not going to have a joint replacement and return to what you remember you used to be. You'll have a joint replacement to do the things you currently do, hopefully better and with less pain. So people often ask about partial joint replacements. Here's just some pictures of a partial knee. To have a partial knee means you only have disease in one area of the knee. Uh, it's very common on the inside part of the knee little less common with the kneecap joint and less common even farther with the outside part of your knee. If you have problems in more than one compartment, doing a partial will not help. 
the potential advantage of a partial is it has a little bit faster recovery. It has a little bit more predictable motion. It tends to be a little bit more predictable for stair climbing. However, if you look at uh, large data sets like our joint registry in Michigan, the chance of a failure of a partial in the first five years is about five to 6%, and the chances of a failure of a total is about 2%. So you have to keep that in mind when you're doing your planning and expectations. Uh-oh, how do I go back? I go back. There we go. <clears throat> total knees. Uh, well, I should update this slide because we're getting close to a million a year. Survivorship, 95% at 15 years or more. 95% good and excellent results. Less defined with more severe disease, less defined in younger patient, less defined when you are not as advanced with your disease because the predictions of what you can expect are a bit better. So we ask you to fill out lots of questionnaires. I know it is uh, cumbersome and I know it's a nuisance, but we like to look at patient reported outcomes and we're getting better at that. And the reason is when we looked at our grading tools that I would do, what we found is how I grade your knee, because I'm looking at your motion, your stability and your function. I often will grade it in a way that seems better than what you're saying. So now we're looking at scoring systems that are asking you specific questions about your function and you grade that. What we're trying to do now is take those scores, collect them before surgery, early after surgery, and late after surgery, and we sort of can track your functional improvement. That's also nice to look at when you, you know, years out, because you sort of forget what your knee used to be like, and you can look back at how you, you felt it was, and that helps sort of organize our thinking as to what we expect. There we go. <clears throat> we have worked hard to make knee replacements and hip replacements <clears throat> minimally invasive. This is not a new term. Nobody doing current arthroplasty procedures doesn't do minimally invasive surgery. Uh, I wrote our first paper on that 15 years ago. So <clears throat> we've done lots of things. We try to make it outpatient because knees are outpatient now. You don't have, you may not like that. The insurance companies, the data collection industry, our outcome data all shows having your knee done, leaving and going home to your own bed, going to outpatient surgery the next day or the day after that has a better outcome than staying in the hospital and or certainly going to a nursing home. To do that, we need to make things better for outpatients. So we give you medicine so your nausea is better. We give you medicine so pain is better. We do injections and certain kind of pain blocks to help. And we give you medicine ahead of the pain to try to get you up and moving uh, quickly. <clears throat> We've changed our designs. Uh, most of the designs that we have now um, are functional. So we get better flexion. We get better st stability side to side with stair climbing. We really are shooting for high flexion components. We've designed knees that fit all genders better. So they're narrower, they have a better engagement of the kneecap, uh, better overall designs in particular. We have to be a little careful, however, with new designs because people wanna know how long is my knee gonna last? It's very hard for me to tell you a brand new design is gonna last 20 years because the only thing I know is gonna last 20 years is the thing we used 20 years ago, but nobody wants a 20 year old knee. So we have to work on a balance both in our study design, in our preclinical clearances, and our uh, grading as we move forward to know what's going to work well. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, uncemented knees. The standard uh, for the last 30 years has been a cemented knee. There was a period when uncemented knees came out. They went away because they were failing early, but what we found out was it wasn't the uncemented part that was failing, it was the plastic that was failing. So once we made better plastics, it looked like we would get past that. Since that time, the companies have made some very interesting implants. So if you look at this one here, 
you can see the undersurface, if you looked at it closely, it looks like a sponge. It's porous, it's printed, it's pure titanium, and bone really likes it. So it goes in very tight, bone grows into it well, and in the right population, we're hoping that these will last longer. Now, we have to be a little bit careful. Again, these are newer devices, and we have to have the right selection criteria. If you look at some early large data sets, it looks like for older patients, particularly women, we may have a little bit of a problem with things like fractures. So we have to gauge who's gonna get these, who's the right patient. I think if we match the implants to the patients, hopefully we're gonna get good outcomes. <clears throat> Many of you have heard about the robots. There are robots now from nearly every company. They're all a little bit different. Uh, I wrote our first navigation paper uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, basically, navigation was effectively using early robot technology, but we did it by hand. So we had, we just like the current robots, we put some pins into the bone. We had trackers. <clears throat> you could then figure out where the knee and the bone was in space, and you could make and check your cuts. With the robots, whether it be Stryker's uh, Mako or the Rosa, which is Smith and Nephew, or uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, Rosa, which is uh, Zimmer, or uh, Smith, Smith and Nephew's implant, or even custom guides. All of these are meant to give us some information in the operating room relative to the balance of the knee, relative to the cuts of the knee, and give us some feedback for us to try to narrow the curve of error and give you the best alignment that we can. Uh, I think we're embarking on a um, kind of a new age over the next probably five to six years because the technologies for computation mo computational modeling is moving along so fast that the ways we'll be able to use these tools is going to change and I believe it's going to change practice. Um, I am doing some work with Smith and Nephew now, as you saw from the disclosures, I was out at um, Carnegie Mellon uh, working with some of their engineers uh, a few weeks ago. And I gotta tell you, these people, they're brilliant. They're, they're way smarter than any of the doctors. And they're coming up with ways to use their implant technology, linking imaging with intraoperative capabilities in a way that we're gonna be able to really move the curve uh, to outcomes. So let's talk briefly about hips. <clears throat> Much of the hip uh, concept is the same. We use topicals, we use anti-inflammatories. Sometimes we use uh, injections, but to do that, we need x-ray or ultrasound. Uh, hyaluronic acid, the gel is not approved for the hip. So if somebody's offering that, uh, you'll probably have to buy it. Uh, but you can see the picture of the bottom left. You can see that that not nice round joint surface is gone. It's a really the same concept as in the knee. Hips tend to be a little bit later in people identifying that they hurt. And part of that is because it's hard to link what's bothering you. With the knee, it becomes very clear. Uh, John Charlie, shown here on the bottom left, had that prosthesis that's just above him. Uh, that was the Charlie cemented arthroplasty. In the United States, if you wanted to do that implant in the late 70s, you had to fly to England and get a license to be able to use the cement. Uh, that implant really is the basis for much of what we use now. Uh, the vast majority of implants that we put in now are done without cement, uh, but we are learning that maybe, particularly for older women, that cement may be a better option because what we're seeing, again, in our large registry data, that the fracture rate in the early post-operative period is quite a bit higher in uh, senescent women uh, who have osteoporosis. <clears throat> now, we talked briefly about MIS knees. Uh, MIS hips, for some reason, is gaining a lot of conversation. Again, <clears throat> not a new concept. Here's a picture, one of mine from uh, at least 10 years ago. Our goal is to you only use the incision that we need, only to disturb tissue that we need, and to be very prudent in how we're approaching the hip. I tend to use something called a uh, mini posterior or direct superior style incision. To do that, it's a small incision. We come up high and outside. It is quite a bit different than the traditional posterior approach that I used when I was in training. So all of these things have evolved. 
when you look at that incision, I do these as outpatients. You get the hip done, you get up and walk. Your groin pain and buttock pain is generally gone right away. You can walk on it right away. The uh, hip surgical pain gets better over the next several weeks. I get asked then, why do I do that? Rather <clears throat> than a direct anterior approach. Well, the DAA is not a new approach. It was described by Smith Pete and Watson Jones in the 40s. It's uh, technically an intramuscular approach, so it goes between some muscles, but you know, the muscles are sort of connected by a fashion. You still have to disrupt that and push them apart. Uh, so I liken that to a rope. And if you take the rope and you don't cut it, but you put your put your finger and spread the fibers, you know, did you cut the rope? Well, you didn't really cut it, but it's not quite the same. In any case, uh, it, it's a little bit more to the front. Here's a picture of the uh, incision. In the right hands, very good operation. We know that there's a bit of a higher risk of bleeding, a little bit higher risk of uh, nerve palsy and getting numbness there in the front that can be bothersome. We know that you can get wound problems if people have a bit of a belly and a panis that hangs over the wound. And there's a bit higher fracture rate of the femur. The reason people do it is it, is, it was believed that the recovery period would be a bit shortened. That hasn't really borne out in the literature and in papers. What we're finding that in the best case, maybe a couple of weeks different early on, but it doesn't bear out. Certainly after two to six weeks, well, after two weeks to six weeks, nobody sees any difference at all. Uh, so you have to weigh which direction you're going. Uh, I think in general, what I tell patients <clears throat> is decide what doctor you like, decide what hospital or surgery center you like, and let them do what they do every day. Because the most important thing is that the implant goes in straight and in well positioned, and we don't have a complication either before or after surgery. And I said surgery center, and I'm going to, we should talk about that some more. You can ask questions. More and more and more patients for total hips and total knees are not going to the hospital at all. We can do this at, at our outpatient surgery centers. Uh, my, one of my partners does them downstairs at the bone and joint. I do ours at the Lake Surgery Center. Uh, we do have a relationship with that center, so there could be a little bit of bias there, but all of the data would say that doing surgery at a surgery center is safe, it's effective, it may be safer than a hospital because you're not dealing with the hospital environment and it definitely has much faster throughput. That being said, if you have significant comorbidities, we may, may tell you you have to do it at the hospital because we need other resources. But your expectation should be that you're gonna get up and walk and you're gonna go home no matter where you're having this done. <clears throat> um, I just put this slide up because I get asked quite a bit uh, the vast majority of implants right now are a ceramic head against a plastic bearing. Uh, there are some things called dual mobility hips. They're still hard on hard bearings, which can be metal metal. Uh, they have fallen out of a bit of favor because of some problems with a couple of devices. But your expectation generally should be that it's going to be ceramic on plastic. So why do we worry? Well, <clears throat> we still see loosening. We still see dislocation. Locations. We still see fractures, and this list has switched around a bit. Uh, we recently published on early revisions, and what we found was <clears throat> that for certain populations, it's different. So that's why I was talking about cement again. So for women over 75, the revision rate, number one reason in the first six to 12 weeks is from a fracture. That rapidly goes down after that period. And then we start thinking about things as hip anti, like infection or instability, but we want to think about the fractures first. When I'm talking about large data sets, there's a number of different resources. The Europeans have been way ahead of us on this, the National Joint Registry in the UK, the Australian Registry, the Swedish Registry. We have the American Joint Registry, which is going very well right now in the US. Here in Michigan, we were very fortunate that Blue Cross, uh, through its funding arm of uh, value-based purchasing programs, helped us to start the Michigan Arthroplasty Registry Collaborative Quality Initiative, Marquee. <clears throat> we have now enrolled 72 hospitals, 15 of which are surgery centers. Ours are part of that as well. We have fully abstracted, meaning collected data 
on nearly 400,000 cases, and we're collecting data on uh, nearly all of the hips and knees done in the, in the state of Michigan. This has allowed us to do a number of different quality projects. I do lead that quality team as a full disclosure, and I'm on the board, <clears throat> but we've done things like early on, we looked at transfusion rate, and just looking at the different uh, graph along the bottom, those are different hospitals, and you can see why is there a different transfusion rate among the different hospitals. So we uh, dug down and we know that transfusion is not a good idea because of complications and you don't want to get blood and it slows everything down and it can have a high risk of infection. So we studied it. We designed an educational program and we presented that out to the different hospitals. And what we were able to do through that educational process is decrease the rate of transfusion. We save many units of blood. We saved Blue Cross well over a million dollars. So it was clearly an effective program. We published, that, we published that work, but then I went back a couple of years later and we looked at it again. And the interesting thing was we found that this sort of program was effective initially, but it was long lasting. So when we went back look, looking five years later, the trend continued to go down and we were very effective at eliminating transfusions as a general risk for first time hip or knee replacements. So in the old days, we used to get um, blood for the blood bank and we used to check your blood all the time. Now we, we don't even get that because the chance of you getting a transfusion is very, very low. And the chance you're getting a transfusion initially right after surgery is almost zero. So while it still could happen, you know, we don't get these at the surgery center. We're not following your levels all the time. And so the outcomes have been very, very good. <clears throat> Here's one on discharge disposition. And basically because of data like this, I, I, I pretty much will tell you, if you tell me that you are not going to go home after surgery and recover at your own house and that you're in, or your family's house and your intent is to go to rehab, and rehab is a nursing home, I'm going to tell you I'm not going to do your surgery. And the reason is we know that your chance of readmission to the hospital, of an infection, of a blood clot, or other complication that leads to a, a poor outcome is at least 20% higher if you go to a facility. So we want to then do all the things we can do with you, with your family, with your friends, to get you to a more safe environment for recovery. Nobody wants to be a bother, but I can guarantee you, your friends and family want to help you. They want you to recover well, and they want you to have the best outcome possible. <clears throat> There's a lot of things that we can do preoperative now. <clears throat> People are not very happy with us when we're telling them we're not going to schedule them for surgery and we have to delay things. But what we've learned is diabetes, so an uncontrolled hemoglobin A1C, generally over eight. We'd really like it in the seven range, seven, five is probably fine. But if your A1C is nine, you're not going to the operating room. BMI, if your height to weight ratio is over 40, Blue Cross won't pay for your surgery. We know the complication rate is higher. We're not calling you fat. It's not healthy. So we need to do all the things we can before surgery to have coaching, planning, and tracking and show that we're trying to change and shift that comorbidity into a safe range so we can operate and smoking is just a hard stop. So we want really good preoperative care. We want good conservative care. We want to engage your primary care doctor. We want to engage your family. We want to be a part of it. But we want to change things before the surgery so we can have the best outcome that we can have. Here's one last thing I'm gonna talk about. <clears throat> uh, internally through our registry, we create data like this. So this is called a funnel plot. Uh, this was a revision rate for surgery or for hips. Um, I can't remember if this, I think this might be, the yellow dot might be me and so, what you're seeing is my dot is falling in the 80% range of acceptable. So I'm right in the middle, of, I'm right in the curve of where we're happy. If you're up in the dots up here, we're not happy because you're having 
higher revision rate than 80 over 95 percent confidence limit and if you're this guy down here he's a really good one to have surgery because he's very high volume with very low revision rate now these are all blinded but we use these to help the surgeons identify if they might be having a problem that they're not recognizing because what we'd love to do is get this guy or gal to talk to this guy or gal and try to figure out what things they're doing differently. Is it an implant issue? Is it a technique issue? Is it a patient selection issue? All those things that we can bring the entire curve down. And this is why Blue Cross loves the program because anything we can do to decrease complications and better outcome, it saves them money, but it's really great for patients. So <clears throat> hip and knee replacements are wonderful operations. Don't believe the propaganda. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. You can have a good and reliable outcome if you maximize your, your uh, potential ahead of time, if you're well-informed and you have good planning. You should have very good long-term success. Evaluate new technology. Again, new things are often good, but you don't necessarily want to be the inventor. You may want to be an early adopter, but you want to be a little careful with that. And you should expect that the vast majority of surgery moving forward is going to be outpatient. Um, you're going to have it done. It sounds really scary, but you're right now at home with a dysfunctional extremity, hip or knee, and you're able to get by. When you're done, it's going to be more stable. It's gonna hurt. We'll give you medicine. We'll give you good counseling and education, but your best and safest environment certainly is to recover at home. I want to make sure I understand the question. If the question is, well, let me, re, I'll answer it differently. I would think the appropriate number of people having partial knee replacements would be only about 10%. So a good outcome, you got to fit into this box. This box is partials. This box is totals. If you notice, the little box is inside the big box. So if you're down here, you could qualify for a partial assuming everything fits. But if you're over here, you shouldn't have a partial. This is about 10% of the market. If the question is, how often do we open up the knee with the intent of doing a partial and say, this is a bad idea, and we bail and do a total, uh, it's pretty infrequent, you know, 1%. But usually we're prepared to do that and have the equipment to do that at the same time we're not usually we don't ever go the, the other way it's like a haircut you know you can start out small and go bigger but you can't go the other way uh if the question is how often does someone have a partial and then needs it revised to a total i would say i'd be hard pressed to give a good number on that i would say you could look at a partial as a transition. It may last you forever, it may not. Definitely the early failure rate is higher as I stated. But if you had a partial, you had a quicker recovery and good function, and it lasted you <coughs> for 10 or 15 years, and then you had to convert it to a total, the conversion is easier than redoing a total. So it can be looked at as a little bit of a transition uh, surgery. I hope that answered the question as a little bit of a long answer. How long does it last? If you make it past five years where we see early things like infections or fractures or dislocations, uh, there's no reason to expect it wouldn't last you forever. So if in fact you have bad arthritis, then I don't, we don't really care about the meniscus. You're already past the point where we would be treating the meniscus. Um, one of the problems we have <clears throat> is many people are getting MRIs when we can already see on their x-ray that they're arthritic. So the MRI doesn't really give us much added information. You can see tearing of the cartilage, the meniscus, but we're not gonna act on that. So uh, let's narrow it down. <clears throat> if you have arthritis in your knee, that is not adequately responding to conservative care, 
bracing, therapy, injections, anti-inflammatories, things like that. And you're at the point where things are uh, bad enough to consider a joint replacement. Then we'd have to do a little bit of an assessment as to how and why you had a blood clot. If you had a blood clot because you have a metabolic abnormality, then you probably have to be on a blood thinner forever. In those cases, we work with the hematologists and our vascular doctors. We can usually put you onto an injectable blood thinner that is short acting for a few days before the surgery, do your surgery, and then put you back on your regular blood thinner the next day. Um, sometimes they'll let you just stop and go back on. Sometimes things are really bad uh, and you're very high risk and uh, or have had pulmonary emboli and things like that. And there's some other steps we can take putting in filters uh, to prevent. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is there's definitely workarounds and ways that we can work through it, but we wanna make sure we're doing it in the safest way we can uh, so that you don't get a, another blood clot or an embolus to your lungs. Um, you have to be mindful though, that when people have had blood clots in their legs, they're definitely higher risk for another one. And they often have uh, decompensation of their veins. And so we really have to fight against um, swelling problems after the surgery. But this is stuff we work with all the time. Uh, you know, you have to, it's really good that you're telling, that you would tell someone you have that uh, because knowing you don't want to get fooled and there's things we can do ahead of time to make the uh, whole situation better. So I would challenge <clears throat> the language. Nobody should be told they need anything for a joint replacement. Nobody needs a new knee. You need brain surgery, you need heart surgery. You don't need knee surgery. You may want knee surgery, which is fine. So if you wanted knee surgery and you were offered a partial, that's fine. If you're offered a total, that's fine. You have to go through that decision-making and risk stratification process that I was talking about to make sure that whichever process or uh, procedure that you're going to have matches your uh, diagnosis and arthritic pattern the best. <clears throat> now, once you're at the point of making a decision to have a joint replacement, if the question is, how long can I wait? Well, for the most part, that's up to you. You could basically wait forever now and you're no danger to do that it may make the surgery more complicated it may make the surgery more difficult it may make the recovery more difficult and it may make your fitness for surgery less positive in that uh, the farther you go the more strength you lose the more balance you lose the more agility you lose and the farther you get behind the eight ball it's just harder to get back to it so i think it's really good to um, match your function your symptoms your exam to what is being offered and try to maximize the timing to get the best outcome So I don't think I can tell you <clears throat> that using the robot in my hands is better than not. Now, I've done thousands of knees. I've been at the front end of both implant and instrument development. So my error curve is, is already pretty narrow and I've I say that because I've studied it. Now, there are definitely certain conditions <clears throat> where having a robot is absolutely very helpful. So <clears throat> think, for example, if you had had, um, if you had broken your thigh bone, your femur, and the way it healed, it's either not quite straight or it has some extra bone around it, and it would make it really difficult to use our alignment devices. In a case like that, the robot is absolutely better because I don't have to use the alignment of the bone to get my instruments where I want them. We can predetermine what we want either from the, uh, the imaging preoperative or intraoperatively, depending on which device you use. 
Uh, like if you use the Cori, you can do it in the OR. If you do it in the Mako, you get the CT. If you use Signature, you get a this MRI. Um, so I think that is, there are certain indications where the robot is definitely helpful. In a straightforward implant, we've had problems having the data show that it makes a big difference. Um, there, but there is information that can be provided either intraoperatively or preoperatively that can help with the planning. So, um, yeah, a long answer. So you have to be pretty specific. Again, the the, the indications of absolute indication are pretty small, uh, and you could have a good income, a good outcome either way. So when you say how I feel taking Motrin, Advil, using a cane, decreasing activities, maybe having an injection therapy are no longer making me happy. And how I feel is worse than the concept of an operation where I could have, you know, a heart attack, a stroke, a blood clot, an embolus, a nerve palsy, uh, having to go through rehab, having an infection, all of which are small, you know, so 95% chance everything is good. And you put that on a scale in your way and say, yeah, I feel terrible. Let's go. Now, that being said, you don't have to torture yourself. You just have to have good decision making and find the right time. Because what you don't want to do is look back at what it should have, could have. Seventy is a perfect age. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, the way you're asking the question, if you're 45, you know, less than 50 is a, you know, by definition, less than, less than 50 is a higher risk patient. Over 70, you know, you have a 90, 95% chance that whatever you have done is going to last you forever. So uh, there's, not, there's not really much reason to wait unless there's other uh, medical issues that have to be improved for you to be able to do the operation safely.